and brothers and friends in Christ. We gather in worship. Welcome to those who are gathering in the pews. Welcome to those who are online with us. Welcome to those who are watching through YouTube or will be watching later. This is the third Sunday that we have been meeting in this hybrid format of being in person and online at the same time. We are continuing to explore. Welcome to all who are gathering in any format. I will remind those who are here in person that although we are not singing hymns and although worship feels different with pews covered and masks on during the musical reflections, if you want to come, it's likely that's okay. As we gather in worship, what announcements do you have to share? Um, legendary um, Village is having a net sale, if anybody's interested. And I also got notified since Evelyn has passed all that we don't have a representative um, to coordinate with that one party. If anybody's interested in being that representative, please see me. In case anyone didn't hear, Monetary Village is having a net sale. Uh, they're also looking for someone who would be willing to take over responsibilities as the, as the coordinator. We'll see Nancy if you have interest. Yes, Jeff. You may remember last week we had a special CBM regarding spending money from the uh, special gifts fund. And those of you who were here physically know that the vote here was Unanimous. Uh, the vote online that you didn't know about until afterwards, but I learned was like uh, unanimous with one exception, and that was an abstention. So the feeling is very obviously strong for us to dip into that fund if we need to. Remember that the resolution was up to that could be anything from a dollar to nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. So doesn't look like we're coming even close. And again, for those who might not have heard online, uh, just sharing that from our brief CBM last weekend, uh, both in person and online, almost unanimous support to use as necessary um, special gifts funds to augment what we've already raised for a new AV system, which we so desperately need. Yes, yeah, Sharon. Um, since the Christian Ed Commission could not have our typical Sunday kickoff little breakfast. Um, we have bookmarks, and some of you got some from Eliana and Kara as you came in this morning. If you did not get one, I put the rest on the table, sort of in back of the offering box. So if you would like one, pick one up on your way out. A little harder to transmit bookmarks online, but we could take a screenshot and you could print it off at home, I suppose. If somebody really wants one, let me know and I'll mail it to them. There you go. <laughs> Friends, as we gather to worship God, to celebrate community that is created whenever we gather, however we gather. Let us join our hearts, our minds, our voices, our very lives in worship this morning. <laughs>
As you are able, I invite you to stand for the call to worship and opening prayer. We are called away from the ups and downs of life to listen to God's voice and leading. We are called to be a part of the world, but to recognize that beyond the concerns and the challenges we see and hear around us, God's word and presence give us life and sustain us. Call on God with hope and expectation. Call out for justice and find rest in the comfort God provides. Come, let us worship together. Let us pray. Holy God, guide us away from the ways of the world to hear your call and follow of you. Guide us away from the temptations to put ourselves first so that we may see that we are the body of Christ and we need each other. We all have different abilities and gifts and all of us are necessary for the building up of your reign on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to see that we need others, that we cannot go this alone, and that you desire for us to reach out in love to all. May our hearts be open to your desire for all of us, that may, we may be one, as you and Christ are one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Chris 
Diego Minibation. And we are also missing some people who are um, to fill in for nursery coverage. So if you if you want to be among those who be standing today uh, on a regular or occasional basis, see one of the Christian Ed members, uh, Sharon Roof or Mimi Bayshore or Bart Yost. Sharon's the only one who's physically here today, so if you have that burning desire, see her. But as we share in an acknowledgement that learning is not just something that teachers do, but is a process that we are all engaged in, and the, the teachers are ones who are willing to help shepherd and lead out. Let us join in a prayer. God, thank you for the response to the calling that you give, the calling that comes from within the congregation, the stirring of the heart that is the movement of the Spirit. Bless and support those who respond to that call, who are willing to take on the challenge and the discipline and the joy of leading groups, whether they are our youngest children or infants to our most senior members and all ages in between. Let the lessons be a beginning point for deeper conversation. Let the preparation done beforehand help to create fertile soil for growth to happen in a variety of ways. Help us to all be engaged in this process of learning. For you continue to fill our lives with questions. Questions that don't always have easy answers, but that lead us into deeper relationship with Bless us as we gather and as we seek to serve you in this way. Amen. The scripture readings, if you have a copy of the order of worship, um, will know are being switched. So that's an intentional choice. Can you hear me if I do things in Moscow? The prophet Micah imagines a day of peace and security, sharing words with Isaiah. In their vision, nations will stream to Jerusalem, the symbolic center of divine presence. Instruments of war will be transformed into tools for harvesting. Micah continues the metaphor beyond Isaiah to include a vision of sitting under vines and fig trees in peace. Micah 4, 1 through 5. In the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and, st and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into, run, into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods. We will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. Jonah is a prophet sent to Nineveh to proclaim destruction. He initially goes the opposite direction, but eventually fulfills God's command. In response, the Ninevites repent and plead for mercy. God's mind is changed. God's desire is not punishment, but restoration. God desires to forgive, to redeem, to restore. God is not punitive, and God's justice is about restoration. 
This makes Jonah very upset and angry. He wants people to get what they deserve. Never mind that he himself ran away from what God was calling him to do. But God desires healing and wholeness, mercy and kindness.
International Day of Peace or International Day of Prayer for Peace. One title could be understood as a celebration of peace, as if it's something that we already have or could have in our grasp. The other is an acknowledgement of what we are lacking with a hope that peace is indeed possible with God's help. It doesn't take someone particularly observant to recognize that we are currently far from our goal of achieving peace. Although we are not actively at war with another country, there's still tension between nations. Last week, an historic setting, signing of an agreement between Israel and Bahrain and the United Emirates made news, United Arab Emirates. However, these countries haven't been at war with each other, and some critics have said it felt more like a press opportunity than an historic achievement. Meanwhile, relationships are still tense with other nations. Oppressive regimes threaten the peace of citizens under their supposed leadership and the peace of people in other countries. Within nations and increasingly noticeable within the United States, we are seeing citizens in open conflict with one another. Racial discrimination, profiling, violence have been regular items in the news. Inappropriate actions by authorities have spurred demonstrations and protests. And some people just seem to delight in stirring the pot and turning already anxious situations into volatile encounters. There is a general sense of unrest. Protests over discrimination are escalating into angry encounters. What is other has become adversarial and experiencing the fullness of being in the United States without additional attacks from other nations indirectly or directly through social media manipulation just makes those anxious feelings even worse. And we know that peace goes beyond interpersonal relationships. We are seeing out of control wildfires on the west coast, increased prevalence of hurricanes on the east coast. Human influence, climate change surely impacts both of them. Wildfires are also raging in Argentina right now. Even the virus that caused our current pandemic has been able to flourish environmental damage that we have probably had a hand in creating. Environmental refugees and migration are on the rise as we continue to endanger species. It is as if we are unintentionally at war with the natural world and our weapons are best. One of the ongoing effects of the pandemic beyond physical health problems are increased feelings of depression, loneliness, feeling overwhelmed, a loss of a sense of hope. Many of us are not at peace within ourselves. Crises of faith are not uncommon in this time, even as many proclaim that faith is the only source of stability that they are finding to see them through times of hardship. For all of these reasons, it's important to offer prayers of peace, to seek the calm that God can provide. Our shared brother and heritage calls us to be people of God's peace, 
to recognize that in Christ, we find a peace that the world is not able to give. And yet, for today, both the reading and the telling come from the Hebrew scriptures, specifically from the prophetic tradition. Both of these scriptures have significant meaning for me, and not only because they happen to be the names of my boys. <laughs> I hope that they say something about the ways that you encounter or wrestle with themes of peace and justice. From the prophet Micah, we may be most familiar with the words from chapter 6, verse 8, what does the Lord require of you but to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God? But almost as familiar, at least to some of us, are the verses that you heard today. This image of each one sitting underneath their vine or fig tree in peace and being unafraid. George Washington quoted it at least 50 times in speeches and personal correspondence. Mount Vernon was his personal vine and fig tree, his place of shelter and respite. And as my Micah reminded me, those words also work their way into words in Hamilton, quoted by George Washington or as the words of George Washington find their way into Hamilton. It is a vision of a world that does not need to struggle against itself and where people can find peace. George Washington even used those words to talk about refuge, that the United States might be a place where immigrants could come and find peace and security. The words have been put into at least one song. If you go on YouTube, you can find plenty of examples of them. One of them, ironically, includes a children's choir singing it as a tribute to U.S. Armed Forces. I have to wonder how it felt to sing, end into plowshares, turn their swords, nation shall learn war no more, and how it felt for soldiers to hear that. Someone commented after the video, did they not understand the lyrics? Another person commented or suggested that it was perhaps an internet intentional challenge to ideas that deep and lasting peace can ever come through military might. The song is taken directly from the verses you heard in Micah. And that section is almost exactly the same as verses in Isaiah 2. They're nearly contemporaries, with Isaiah and those who followed in his name written in or around Jerusalem and in exile in Babylon. Micah was also a prophet in the more rural part of the southern part of Judah. Both speak of a day when people of all nations will stream to God's house, that the temple of the Lord is raised above the highest of the mountains, is a vision of a time when divisions between nations or among nations will no longer exist. Instead, the desire to live in peace will be greater than the desire to conquer, to destroy, or to dominate. Well, I invite you to think, what are the places, physical or otherwise, where you are currently finding respite from the troubles that you experience in life? A little later in the Joys and Concerns, you're welcome to share those out loud if you desire. Although Isaiah and Micah's vision has not been fully realized, still one we hold before us, an image that continues to guide our hopes and prayers for peace. Even in uncertainties, these prophets found comfort and trust that God would lead all people of all nations in 
to life beyond political posturing, even when others don't live into that vision. God sustains. This is peace without war and peace that dwells in our hearts as we dwell in gifts that give shelter and feed bodies and spirits. Under our personal vines and fig trees, we find rest from the struggles of life in and around us. It's a beautiful image. In about a century after this vision, Jonah, who appears first in the Bible but came later, on a different approach to God's involvement in life and a different kind of call for peace. The story of Jonah is familiar to many of us, if not all of us. Even Jonah's pediatrician, who does not proclaim any faith tradition of any kind. When I brought him to a first appointment with her, she said, isn't Jonah the one that was swallowed by the whale? <laughs> Jonah, the prophet, gets a bad rap. Beyond the fish story, he's often remembered first as a disobedient prophet, then one who sulks and can't appreciate any good thing that happens. But the early church didn't focus on those parts of the story. The New Testament and the early church focused instead on the time that Jonah spent in the belly of the fish or whale as a metaphor for death and resurrection. Today's scriptures aren't about that experience. It comes after Jonah has been spewed onto the shore and after he delivers his message of doom to the Ninevites. As a rabbi pointed out in a Jewish Christian dialogue about the book of Jonah, whether or not this was meant to be a literal story or an allegory or even satire, Jonah is the only prophet in all of the scriptures whose words are immediately taken seriously, and by a foreign body, no less. The people of Nineveh, beginning with the common people and reaching all the way to the king, believe Jonah's words, and they take action. They put on sackcloth and ashes, and what must have been an attempt to generate some humor, they even include the cows in wearing sackcloth and ashes. The king doesn't promise it will make a difference, but he humbles himself anyway, saying, who knows, maybe the Lord will relent. For someone who doesn't worship this God, he sounds penitent, worthy of forgiveness. Jonah, by contrast, just seems petty. But as often the case, behind the story there is another story, one that Jonah knew all too well. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And the Assyrians had a particularly violent and bloody history with Israel and Judah. They killed without compassion or sensitivity to whoever was innocent. They didn't care that the women or children or animals were raped, killed, or slaughtered in their thirst for conquest. Prophesying their destruction would be easy and welcomed by Jonah. Living with awareness that it is God's nature to show mercy, even to those who have caused pain and destruction, been a bitter pill for him to swallow. So Jonah gave his message and then settled at a distance to see what would happen, a little bit like the Grinch, waiting to see the who's, would, how they would respond on Christmas morning when all of their stuff has been taken away. Except Jonah already anticipated the true outcome. As one commentary named, while Job was concerned about undeserved suffering, Jonah was concerned about undeserved mercy. As 
Jonah sought back, willing himself to die rather than to see what was unfolding before him, to envision a God who seemed complacent in the face of his enemies. God asked twice, is it right for you to be angry? And maybe the question hangs there as an acknowledgement that sometimes anger is justified, even perhaps anger at God, when justice seems far from reality. It is not a place to permanently dwell, but anger has the potential to lead to action and change. Jonah is a prophet who is willing to confront God about the injustice that he sees. The second time God asks about anger is after the bush that is given shade to him is destroyed by a worm sent by God. When Jonah again dramatically asks for his life to be taken away. God asks if it's right for him to be angry about the bush. And although Jonah again felt justified, God intervenes. If Jonah could care about a bush that came and went in a day that he had no part of creating, then wasn't it reasonable for God to care about these misguided Ninevites and the animals, all of whom were created by God. The reading and the book end with that question, leading us to answer it for ourselves. How will we respond to injustices that we see around us? There's a place for anger. Hearing that the cause for wildfires was the explosion of a pyrotechnic display in a gender reveal party feels like it's not only a waste of resources, but an incredibly irresponsible and privileged act with devastating effects on people's lives and God's creation. Some who are directly experiencing the devastating effects of wildfire on people's lives, who are living in fear themselves. But even for those of us who watch from a distance, it's hard to put aside feelings of grief and some anger. The very recent death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, some are calling out injustice in voices who were calling a new Supreme Court justice, even though four years ago they said it was too close to the election. We sit under whatever shade or respite we can find in difficult times. Through physical and online communities, through other sources of stress relief amidst scorching heat, Sometimes it's hard to offer grace. COVID feels a little bit like our typical sources of comfort have been removed or at least diminished. Jonah's anger is a call to remember that injustice should make us uneasy and uncomfortable. Crying out in frustration or anger is part of our larger peacemaking work. Yet, in our indignation, we are also challenged to remember that God's love is not partial. Justice is not about revenge or punishment. It is a call to right wrongs and to restore what is broken. <clears throat> Being willing to cut off relationships and to hope for another's harm not the way or the voice of God. That's important for us to remember, especially in this time. This past Thursday, annual conference moderator Paul Mundy hosted a town hall meeting with Andrew Young, whose many accomplishments include working side by side with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Civil Rights Movement. And one of the questions posed to him 
came about responding to the person's neighbors who have Confederate flags flying and who lift up white nationalism. Somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, Ambassador Young's response was not about shouting down hurtful racist voices or a wish for their destruction. Instead, he spoke of those views as sickness and in need of prayer. Get angry at the injustice you see. Continue to pray for persecutors. As Jesus proclaimed and as Paul affirmed, there is a place for anger, but let us not be so consumed by spite that we ourselves lose the ability to receive God's comfort. This time it may be hard for us to find a vine or a fig tree, and bushes wither in scorching heat. Yet God's promises through the prophets continue to call us to seek and even to find peace. Under whatever sources of comfort we can find in online gatherings, in small face-to-face -face meetings, in groups of like-minded folks and possibilities of graceful encounters with those who do not see the world in the same way that you or I might. We are still invited to find and offer shelter that gives peace. We're challenged and invited to find respite from the struggles around us and the struggles within us. Let us continue to seek to be people of God's peace praying for those who have harmed us intentionally or unintentionally. And we seek and trust in God's grace and mercy for the places and times when we have been caught up in indignation so much so that we are willing to put aside care for the other. May this day of call for peace fill us instead with gratitude for the peace that we have been able to experience. And may we continue to pray for those places where peace remains a distant vision that we still long to grasp.
neglected to mention earlier, but thank you also to the seven or eight people who came to the parsonage yesterday and scraped and painted windows. Will you join me in prayer? God of all times and places, God of our deepest experiences and our surface skimming through life, God of our celebrations, and God who is present in our greatest challenges. We thank you that you are with us, that when we despair, your words give us peace. Thank you for surprise birthday celebrations and baby showers of relief from work, signs of hope. We give thanks that in all of these great and small ways, we remember the joy that comes that you are with us. And God, in our despair, in the frustrations that we feel in the injustices that we experience or that we empathize with on others' behalf, in the places where we feel helpless to make significant change, we offer prayers to you, knowing that each of these prayers is one of the ways that we help to bring about greater peace in the world especially when those prayers are accompanied by a commitment to serving one another in love. God, inspire in us, even through holy anger, a commitment to care for one another, to see good in our neighbors, or if we are not able to see good, to refuse to back down to a base level. Help us to show love even when love is not returned. Help us to trust that your justice is beyond what we can fully understand, but at the end gives hope and peace to us, gives rest, and feeds not only our bodies but our souls. In times of illness, we look for your healing in whatever forms that it takes. Sustain us so that we might lift our lives to you in gratitude, hope, and joy, and in peace. In Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs> Pray for peace in every nation, 
in every city and village, in every neighborhood, may we begin by living in peace with each other. May we covenant that as far as it depends on us, we may live in peace. Prince of Peace. We cannot pray for peace without justice. We cannot pray for peace without mercy. We cannot pray for peace without love. May we seek peace that restores. May we seek justice for the oppressed, for all who are on the margins. May we grant mercy as you have given us mercy. May we forgive as we have been forgiven. May we see each other's humanity. May we see the face of Christ in each other. May we love our neighbors as ourselves. May we love others as Christ loves us. May we welcome strangers as friends. Spirit of peace, descend upon us, mold our hearts to be full of your love. May we seek peace and pursue it. May we strive for peace in all we do. May we be peacemakers. May we build up the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. May we bring peace in all we do. May we speak peace in all we say. May we be peace to each other. In the name of God, who covenants with us in the name of peace, in the name of Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, in the name of the Spirit who breathes into us peace, may we be peace.